Have you ever wondered how to start a blog? Have you ever wondered how is it that there are some people who just seem to get their message out there and they seem to be making a living, adding value, sharing something, and that part of you, you're thinking to yourself, I can do that too. Well, if that's you, if you have ever thought about writing a blog, doing a video blog, getting into digital marketing and bringing your products and service to the market through sharing your voice, sharing your story, then you are in for a treat. My new great friend, Tim Gillette, is here to share how to break through in the blogosphere in video blogging. Cue the intro. Welcome to The Real Deal, where we get real about what it takes to succeed. Whether it's wealth, health, relationships, or finding your purpose, we talk to the masters to uncover the secrets to defying the odds and creating your own rock star legacy. I'm Doug, and after working on multiple Grammy-winning records as an author, transformational speaker, and your personal translightenment coach, I'm committed to your growth and success. And now, here's the real deal. Welcome to the real deal on success. I was having some fun here. All right. So welcome, my friends, to The Real Deal on Success. We have a very special guest today. Uh, You are in for a treat. And before we begin, a time for a word from our sponsor. Are you feeling stressed out? Are you feeling under the pressures of the world all these challenges are you ready to maximize your mindset then go ahead to mindsetmaximizer.com get your free guided hypnotic meditation where you will learn how to let go of anxiety trepidation and access even more confidence so go ahead to mindsetmaximizer.com all right so this is tim's fancy coach biography he shared to me that uh, Tim are you ready for the the second best intro you've had all day uh yes it, it might even be the best I, it I might you know. be it might be the best I mean because only God has woken me up so far and and you can compete with him sometimes <laughs> Tim, Tim, Tim this is God continue being awesome all right so Tim Gillette sold his car wash business in 2004 after meeting with a personal friend and mentor, Zig Ziglar. Zig told him he would make a great speaker and coach. He began then began to share how the way he was helping other people in the car wash business was actually coaching and people pay for that kind of help. Such is true. And even with that kind of sage advice and support, Tim took five years to follow it. Instead, he went to work for Star Starbucks as a barista and shift manager. It was in 2009 when Tim ran into Zig again. He told him then he was going to try out that speaking and coaching thing that he told him all about. He would get a haircut, buy a suit and tie, and start a career in speaking. Zig Ziglar then gave him the greatest advice ever. He said, Tim, 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 Tim. you would really really suck at being Zig Ziglar, but you would make a great great Tim Gillette. Gillette. Tim still did not know what direction to take this. He started with a blog on WordPress.com, building a following. He would then spend 2010 to 2014 trying to establish his niche, helping entrepreneurs. In 2015, while at a mastermind, Tim was asked, what are the two biggest things you get asked to speak about? The answer was blogging and branding. Tim now speaks and trains about creating content online using a blog. He created online programs as well as workshops, both live and online to help speakers and coaches use a blog as the center point to build their own businesses. And that's how he got his start as an online blogging mentor. So welcome, Tim. So I just thought we'd have some fun with that intro. 
So first of all, thank you so much for giving your most valuable asset, your time and wisdom and energy. Honored so, to be here with you. Love it. So what's going on? How, uh, first of all, how does one just happen to become a, uh, a friend and mentor of the great Zig Ziglar? Well, the easiest thing was, is you start with, you know, giving, helping him get what he needs. He needed his car washed. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I had a business washing cars. He needed his car washed. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's and as you simple as that. Now, did you know that he, who he was? Did you know that was the great Zig Ziglar? When, well, the first time I ever met him, I knew who he was, but I'd never read his books. I had never really heard him speak, but I, I'd heard his name. And I was introduced to him by a gentleman who took me to his church. And it was one of those walking out the parking lot. And he goes, Tim, I want to introduce you to somebody. And I turn around and he goes, Tim, Gillette, Zig Ziglar. And I shake hands with him. That's the first meeting I ever had with him. And to me, everybody, I, I treat everybody like they're normal. So I treat him like he was a normal human being. I didn't, right. didn't, didn't think he was a god or anything. And because of that, I got to know him on a personal level. Uh, I, I've done that same tactic with many other celebrities. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you know what I mean? You get such golden, should I say golden nuggets of life because you're not sitting there going, oh my gosh, I'm in the room with the famous dog. You know, no, it's no, it's your, your dog. It's cool. Let's just be friends. And that is where I, I got to connect with him on a more personal level. I really, I've only ever seen him speak twice, Doug. Okay. Twice, two times. I've only, it's the only time. I, speaking yeah. professionally, you've, professionally, you've spoken yeah. with him multiple times. And multiple times, I've had co personal conversations. Yeah. But as a speaker, only two times I've ever seen. I've seen his son Tom speak more than I've seen him speak. Wow. So yeah. as a um, seeing both sides of it, was he the same on stage as off stage? He is so personal off stage, right? He's he's personal in the way he teaches, but off stage. Everybody who walks up, he will try to give, he tried to give anybody and everybody who came up to him and just was respectful. He tried to give them the most respect of their time that he possibly could. And, really? and he treated everybody like you were the hero. That's the way he treated people. And I, it, it just, it was interesting to watch. So, mm. so, so you obviously as a business owner, you know, let's kind of go get some history on how you were able to reinvent yourself because that's really what you did, right? Going from a, a business owner to, it's still a business owner, but rather than the car wash being the product and service, you are the product and service. Um, and prior to the car wash, were you already a business owner? Like, so how did, you know, the young Tim Gillette grow up and and find his way into that kind of ownership and then make that transition because you did you went from owning a business to becoming an employee to then branching out again which is phenomenal well i went back and forth Doug, over the years uh from employee to business owner i i, I must have ping pong back and forth at least seven or eight times i would start a business uh it would grow for a while then it would start failing you know, so then i'd sell the business or quit and go get a job again and, and go back and forth uh, I owned car wash or auto repair businesses in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Texas. Wow. Uh, and yeah, I started in Pennsylvania. It's where I grew up. And my first car wash endeavor was I just Saturday and Sundays, I would wash people's cars. That was what, what my first endeavor. And I had a job working for a dealership during the day. And, uh, you know, and then when I moved to New England, I did the same thing. I worked a job and then did it on the side. It was when I came back to Pennsylvania that I started my first uh, business of it where it was my full-time job my full-time business and at one point in time I had two body shops going and a car dealership all right and it wasn't like your fancy big you know Ford GMC whatever dealer no I had like four cars for sale on a lot okay. in front of my place uh, but I had you had in order to sell four cars in your lot you had to have a license to be a dealer in Pennsylvania it's just it was the laws so I was classified as a dealer um, and that business, you know, I, I want to say that was probably one of my most unique ones because that business, when I sold it in 97 or 98, when I, I left Pennsylvania, it had two very, very important patents. The stuff that I had learned throughout the years that went with the business. And one of those patents you can still see in every tire shop today. Uh, and it was something that we came up with the idea. We had it drawn up. We, we secured the patent onto it. And it went with the company. It was part of the value of the company. Wow. And it went. And the the people who bought it, that's those two patents is what they sold off. 
and then they dismantled the whole auto. You know what I mean? The auto. <laughs> that's all they wanted was the. That's uh, all they patents. wanted was those two things. But those two things, uh, you know, being paid to get me out of debt. Thank right. God I had them in my back pocket, and I, I never would have had the money or you know the R and D to make them come to have come to fruition. So the second one was based on a, a PPG paint design. You know what I mean? Using PPG paints, and Dupont actually took the idea. And there was a whole thing with it in like the early 2000s that DuPont tried to tried to steal it and go around the patent. All right. Wow. And it didn't work and they got shut down. So then they just went in and bought the patent from the company who owned it. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So were you always into cars? Like, is that how you were into that? Or is it just an opportunity that? Yeah, I was itself? as a kid, I was always into cars as a kid. I remember I can tell you my my uncle's first my uncle's cars, you know, my dad's trucks. You know, I, I was it was something that fascinated me as a kid. You know, and I owned many a cool cars, but like it was something that grabbed me and 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 had my interest. And I was like, man, I'm going to be in the auto industry forever. And shocked that, you know what I mean? I'm now out of it. What, 19, 18 years or so I'm out of it. I've not been in the auto industry now. So, yeah. Wow. So you obviously you've traveled quite a bit um, and you did this transition bouncing around. You, you followed a passion for a period of time, worked out a deal. Uh, Zig shared with you that and you said when he first told you that, what was your initial thought when like, so, oh, you'd be a great speaker and coach. I looked at him and went, me? Huh? What? You kidding? I, you know, and, and the coaching thing at the time. I didn't understand like now I'm, I'm kind of classified as a business coach, but I, I, at the time I looked at it and I went like, you mean at the, at, at church, the, the kids playing football coach? Like I, <laughs> I didn't get it. I really, I didn't get it. And Zig explained to me that everybody I met in the car industry and in the car wash, like I was a mobile type business and I would meet these individual mobile guys. And I would just like Zig would talk to them. I would talk to them and I would sit there and give them a couple of advice on how to make more money and save time to in their business. And Zig said, Tim, that's that's uh, coaching. People pay for that. You know what I mean? You're giving it away for free. And I'm like, oh, OK. Well, it's um, value okay. add. Yeah. It's, it's part of the premium package when the, yeah. uh, the, the, their car is getting waxed. Yeah. Uh, but like I the speaking thing and there's still days that I still doubt I'd be a good speaker. But like there was something that Zig's seen in me because of the fact of the church we went to and I'd be asked things like, you know, hey, Tim, will you get up and do the prayer today? OK. I mean, I never sat and was like, you know, people going through, you know, the, the you know, I mean, the programs to get confidence. Hmm. I didn't need them. I just, OK, yeah. OK, you told me to do it. OK, I get up and did it. You know, uh, Tim, we need you to read this scripture in front of the church of 13,000 people. OK, I would grab the Bible, get up and read it. It wouldn't. I never thought about it. It didn't hmm. cross my mind. Oh, my God, I'm standing in front of 13,000 people. I just did it. It wasn't, and that's where Zig. That's the that's the picture Zig seen in me. And he said, "Tim, that this is." He says, "You don't know how many people come to me want to be a speaker who can't get up in front of five people and say, uh, 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 hi, I'm Tim.' You know, right. they, he's, you know, you no problem with it.' Now I do have the ums and ahs and filler words in there, like the, you know, I mean, I never went to training for that, but I'm much better at it now than I was. But it, it's it's not. It wasn't a most of the people are there. It's not a confidence thing. You know what right. I mean? For me, I had no problem with it, and I don't know why. And, well, yeah. and that's how people get away with also fillers is that if you have that level of confidence and certainty, those fillers are overlooked. It's when yeah. people are crutching with them and they're yes. using yeah. that as fillers for not having the confidence. And it's more of like a nervous tick as opposed to having a thought going through your head and you're just so quick and, and you're trying to grab it all. There may be some of those filler words just because your brain is busy thinking of how to support and serve the, the audience. Yes. So brilliant. So here's what's interesting that I guess could be very helpful for people because, of course, you know, you're the only one who's ever had to reinvent themselves or figure something out to do when things are interesting. And there's never been interesting times, you know, to come our way. Um, but if there were someone to do that, perhaps they'd be able to get this. You finally made that decision. You went back. And I guess part of your pattern was you, you had a gig or you owned a business, feeling pretty good, and then went back and got a job, you know, J-O-B. Before we get into now, like, 
future pacing and getting into that that head of speaking and, and blogging and figuring out your, your niche and all of that, what was it like to bounce between, because we're all going through these different times making decisions. Sometimes we got to do things that maybe feel like stepping backwards or things of that nature. What was that experience like for you and how did you navigate that? Uh, for me, going the, the step backwards after owning the company and my car wash company, you know, it was a million dollar company, but like I didn't see a million dollars every day just because I had a million dollars flowing through it. But I went from a million dollar company to serving people coffee. And most people will go, well, that's a huge step back. For me, I had to get out of the automotive industry. I had a 10 year do not compete, all right? Mm. And all I'd known for 20 some odd years was the auto industry. So it was a stumble for me. And when I got the job offer at Starbucks, at the time I went, okay, it's a part-time job. It gives me um, gives me benefits. I don't have to pay for my insurance anymore. I can buy 401k, I can put money aside. And it wasn't a lot of money, but I didn't need a lot of money to survive. So mm -hmm. I was kind of felt like I was semi-retired. But when I took that step back, there's something that I now have learned through that, that I really believe every kid should do a service job of some sort. Mm -hmm. You know, I, at Starbucks, I became a shift manager and they wanted me to become a store manager. And I didn't want to go that far, but I implemented something that is still used today in Starbucks training in the Dallas area because of the fact that uh, I'm, I'm a thinker. I, I literally, I don't just come in and mindlessly do a job. I think, how do I improve it? I've never, I've always been that way. I've never stopped thinking that way. And when I came to Starbucks, the number one thing that got me was we are in the people business making coffee. And I had to, I had people come in and if you ever go into some of the Starbucks and you see our, our coffee shop and you see the guy making coffee and he's looking down the whole time trying to make the coffee and you're standing there talking to him and he goes, uh-huh, uh-huh. And he doesn't look up. Mm. That bugged me. I'm like, we're in the people business serving coffee. I have to hold a conversation with that guy while I'm making his drink. So we come up with a training way to help people to learn to do two things at once, to be able to hold the conversation with the customer. And that is what got me cemented and loved as a, as a someone who worked for Starbucks, is I would hold a conversation with everybody. And there's a lot of people I didn't like, but I still would hold a conversation with them because we were in the people business serving coffee and it became a huge life lesson for me. Wow, very cool. And touch upon a little talking to people you didn't like uh, because we're in and again not that that's possible today that anyone could be divisive or you know have differing opinions and not like someone and people you know no one would unfriend anybody or anything like that so of course since that never happens maybe this uh, conversation is is pointless and just out of curiosity, how did you find yourself able to communicate with people you may not have um, enjoyed their presence so much? They, they, number one, I, I worked at Starbucks. I was there to make their coffee. Again, I'm, I, I get it. I'm in the people business making coffee, but they came there for a reason. They came to get coffee. The bonus was is they had to like the people making the coffee. Mm. I didn't have to like them. That was the bonus for them. I had to make that coffee for them because that's a service or a product they paid for. And if I'm behind there and my name's on that, making that drink, it's got to be the best. Right. So whether I like you or not, I have to give you what you paid for. Right. That's right. business to me. Right. Right. And but the conversation is the conversation was part was the bonus. That was what right. Starbucks wanted. And just because I disagreed with you or didn't like you doesn't mean you got treated differently. No, you paid for a product and service. I need to give you that product and service. Got it. So great. You voted for, you know, whoever I voted for whoever. Who cares? It doesn't matter at that moment in time. I am making you coffee and I need to make you feel like this part of your day is the most special in your day. So when you walk out that door and crap happens, you are actually now go, you know what I mean? I started my day off good. That guy, Tim, is awesome. And then later you find out, oh my God, Tim and I totally disagree on, 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 on whether we should have a mask on or not. I can't believe that we're friends right. because I never put that up. That's not, that wasn't part of the deal right. to talk about that. Exactly. The part of the deal was, hey, so, so, so what are you doing today? All right, what, what, what are you working on today? You know, it's like, it wasn't about that. It wasn't about the things we disagreed on. It was about you and your day. It wasn't about Tim and his problems. And when I separate 
my when I put me into the equation, it is no longer about you, the customer. Right. I had to take me out of the equation. So. Ah. So there's a nice nugget, nice takeaway, is when you're communicating with another, no matter what, in situations such as that, when you take yourself out and you don't make it about you, you make it about them, you now bypass any challenges you'd have in the first place. Yes. Ooh, love it. Very nice. So, okay. So thank you for that nugget. So now you've, uh, you've done a few years as barista. You're ready to, at some point, maybe you've had the conversation going on in your head and was it by divine design you bump back into Zig because you don't have the, the, the uh, car wash anymore. So was it by just divine providence or because you go to the same church or how was it that you reconnected with Zig and then you were ready for that next stage? Great, great, great question, because it, this is most unique that most people would never think things like this happen. My daughter was here in the Dallas area. She was working as a as a receptionist at like a, they had a little doctor's center in a, in a supermarket that was close to Zig's house. And I'm there visiting my daughter one day and there goes Zig and Jean walking around the corner in the grocery store. So I just like, oh, my God, I haven't seen, seen Zig in two years. So I run up to say hi to him. And that was the two years after he had, you know, very much, you know, illnesses and mm -hmm. and was still not totally with it. And I come up and go, Zig, Gene, it's Tim. Good to see you. All right. And Zig turns around and goes, oh, my gosh, it is so good to see you. But I could tell by looking at his face that he wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. And that's where it hit me. Um, the, the guy who is the like the best in the business told me I should do that business. And I refer it as a lot, all right, not to be play the political game, but I referred at that time for many years, I said, having Zig Ziglar tell you you should be a speaker is kind of like having Bill Clinton tell you you should run for president. All right, the guy was pretty good at it. You know, he knew what he was doing. And if he could see that in you, maybe you might want to listen. And seeing Zig's failing health, I went, oh, my God, I was given world-class advice and I threw it in the trash. Mm. What kind of idiot am I? And I actually looked at him and literally that was the conversation. I said, you know, Zig, uh, and I had long hair at the time. I said, I'm, I'm going to get a haircut and I'm going to go buy a suit and a tie and, and I'm going to I'm going to do that speaking thing he told me to do. And that was where the end was in the grocery store and Zig had just met my daughter for the first time. And, and that was the most unique thing in the world to have Zig go, Tim, you got to work with this hippie thing. All right. You would really suck being me, but you'd make a great Tim Gillette. And that was the, 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 the you know, I mean, divine thing. If I didn't see Zig in that ailing health, I probably would have never triggered it. So wait, but did he tell you not to get a haircut and to keep yeah. your, yeah, wow. He's, he was yeah. like, be you. Yeah, be you. And that's it. I mean, I, and I, I, I tell people, you know, being you is a fluid situation because you notice I have short hair now, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's, it's was unique. I had to not just come out and, and, and follow the cookie cutter of what goes in that position. I would never have succeeded if I just followed the cookie cutter Right. of being a speaker because there's just too many pe there's too many speakers out there who are cookie cutters and we right. don't need we need more of them yeah wow brilliant so go to that so that so now you've made that decision you're going to go into for, for lack of a better term uncharted territory for you because it's not like you know it's, it's one thing to have you know zig as a friend and to give you some advice and and so forth but you have not at this stage been immersed in that field which is by now you figured out is pretty unique and has its own you know kind of language and processes and so forth while a lot is you know basic business applications there's also a lot of like you shared that personal touch how do you stand out marketing is you know is a unique yes. animal how did you start moving into speaking and what were some of your first steps to clarify who you were as a speaker and a coach and a trainer and, and bringing to, you know, obviously we, your blogging is, was the thing you ended up, but was that always what you were doing? No. Uh, so, I mean, luckily for me, it, 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 I never, by the way, looked to get out of Starbucks. I would have stayed at Starbucks forever as an employee, but uh, fortunately I had gentlemen come by and offer me a job to run their company, which I left for, I worked for them for six months and connections I made there helped me start a real estate investment company. Mm. So I was very fortunate to go, okay, I can go do, I can go do this and learn it. So I quit Starbucks altogether 
and relied on my income coming in from the real estate company and said, let me go research this and figure it out. Most people, when I, I tell them in business, always have something, I always have something to pay the bills while you're learning. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, I had that. So I spent the time learning it. And I, I literally, I started with, you know, taking online courses on how to be a coach, online courses on marketing. And like, I've got no formal education. It was just studying what tools I could get to learn it. And like, I started my first brand was called Rocker Life Coach. It was just, that's what I come up with. It sounded mm -hmm. cool and it worked. I own the domain name. And I, I didn't know what I was gonna do with it. I really, I didn't understand it. I was still studying. And my friend Brian, uh, right, during a period of my life when I was homeless, I was living on his couch. Uh, you know, he's since moved from Dallas to the Carolinas. And he put this article up one day on Facebook, would be about 2010. And the article, he just like, here, go read this article I wrote. And I went over and clicked it. And it was on Facebook or Word, WordPress.com. And I clicked it. And at the bottom of it, it said, start your own WordPress.com account here. And I'm, I'm learning. So I'm like, okay, let me click it and figure out what this is. Within five minutes, I had a WordPress.com account. I didn't understand what the blog was yet, but I had an account. I could figure this out, right? Mm -hmm. And I just started studying it. And one day I realized I have to produce articles on there to get people to do that. I did know how to write articles because I was working for a ministry where I was on the, the management team and had to produce an article every month for the, for the newsletter. So I knew how to write. I had that down. So it's like, okay, I'll just go write these articles and, and figure it out. And the first one was done on April 1st, 2010. No kidding. All right. Woke up that morning and said, okay, I'm going to produce my first article today. I'm going to do it. I have no idea what I'm going to write about. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do one of those tricks of I'm going to set a timer and go do a task for 30 minutes. And my task was I'm going to go clean my garage for 30 minutes and see if I can think about what I'm going to write about. And in 30 minutes, I completed the whole garage. I got it all done in 30 minutes, something I've been putting off for four weeks and, and did it in 30 minutes flat. I come upstairs and I went, ah, oh, why don't I write about changing your world 30 minutes at a time? Sometimes if you just get started, you'll realize that the task takes shorter. And I wrote that blog post and most people are all worried about, oh, I'm scared about what I'm going to write first. I wasn't scared. Again, I've never had problem with writing and putting things or doing things and putting it out there and falling on my face. I put it out there, Doug, and, and, most people would not know my first article if I didn't tell them. Hmm. You know, I have mine out there because I said, this is my first article. And I tell the story all the time of, I just put it up there. It was on my first day and uh, this is the name of the article. And everybody goes back to research it to see if I really did write it on April Fool's Day. And yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So when you started the writing, so you started the blog, but you're still, you, you, you're still in sort of education mode. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you start turning it into like a, a business as opposed to just throwing it out there and seeing what happens? Like, what was that course like? And how did you uh, start figuring out how to monetize? It would be it would be almost a year before I got that into a business. It was from the 2010 to 2011 the the I would throw an article up every now and then. And it wasn't until you know, it was December 2000 and, 10 that my wife, girlfriend at the time were talks, she said, maybe you should do something on a regular basis, be consistent and see if it helps. And I'm like, yeah, I need to do that. And the eye opener came that I went, okay, I really have to seriously get off my butt and do some work on New Year's Eve, 2010. My mom was visiting here in the Dallas area and I was using my father-in-law's car and driving around with my mom and she gets a weird phone call. And after she shouts at the phone for the third time, yes, this is Mrs. Gillette, what do you want? And then the nurse on the other side of the phone picked up the phone and said, Mrs. Gillette, your husband was brought in here two hours ago. He passed away. Oh. That was my wake up call. The day a gentleman loses his dad, he grows up. And I grew up that day a lot. I'm the oldest brother of three. I have three younger brothers and I had to grow up and I'm like, okay, I need to do something. So I started then going, let me find a way to be consistent. And the week of my dad's birthday was March. So from he died in, in December, March, I finally go, okay, I'm gonna do this on a weekly basis. I'm going to pick a weekly theme and write five subjects about that theme just to try that for now. My first weekly theme was real hope and change in the world. And I told the story of five people who impacted my life on a personal level. 
One of them was a girlfriend that I dated many, many years ago, and I dated her after after she lost her husband. All right, and and that's when we dated. Another one was a lady that I worked with at Starbucks who was abused and had to leave Oregon and move to Texas to get away from her her ex that abused her. The third one um, was my friend Rob Skiba, who I just had on my podcast just last week. Um, I forget who the fourth one was, but the fifth one was my dad. And I actually had to do some research to get the story about my dad and everything. I had to talk to his sisters and stuff like that to get the conversation out. But that was my first, shall we say, semi-viral blog post. Uh, 150 people came to read that blog post about my dad. Wow. All right. And I was able to tell the story of my dad. And, and um, the, two, the greatest thing, I, I, why I called it hope and change, is when, when my, uh, a year before my dad died, he said, I only had two bad days in my life. The day he lost his brother-in-law and the day his grandkids were, his, my, my one brother's ex-wife picked up the kids and moved away, moved from Pennsylvania to Florida with the kids. He says the only two bad days in his life. And then I went and researched and found out my dad was the, was the son of the cleaning lady. All right. And I don't want to go into all the things that my grandma did because I still hold her on a pedestal. She was my grandma. All right. But all the things my grandma did to support her kids. And my dad was the boy and he was called the bastard son. And, you know, my dad never knew his dad until he was 27 years old. And he knew his dad for a couple of weeks and his dad died. And my dad had one pair of pants that he had to wash out every night and put back on the next day. He was picked on all kinds of ways that you can imagine any yet when he died at 69, 70 years of age, he said, I only had two bad days in my life. Wow. And I'm like, oh my God, you went through all this as a kid. And I sit and look at my life and go, oh man, I can't believe the kids picked on me and realized my dad never considered those bad days as he, as he progressed in his life. Right. And that story made me go, okay, it's time to get serious. And that's where we started with the blogging on a regular basis. And we became, I was consistent five days a week. I did it for up to two, it was almost two years. It was 2013 when I stopped blogging every day. And some of the areas that I learned in there to help build my audience. And I had to learn to build the audience first, build the community before you try and monetize it. Mm. And some of the unique things I had was the first one was I, I wrote a blog post about entrepreneurs I want to meet. And one of them was John Schneider, who founded Papa John's Pizza. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the story as to why I wanted to meet him. And literally, John Schneider found the article and called me. Oh, That was the most bizarre thing in the world to have him call. And he's like picking up the phone, not knowing who it was. And he goes, you know, Tim Gillette, this is John Schneider. I heard you wanted to meet me. <laughs> it was a wow. bizarre moment in my life because he read the article. And that made me go, okay, I can do things to outreach. The next one on there was uh, learning what my niche was. Eventually, we went down to songs. I started writing about songs, and I was the rocker guy and, and writing about songs and music. I would take a song title and talk about how it motivated me. We learned that one from a song that impacted me in 1981-82 was Jukebox Hero from Foreigner. Mm -hmm. I love that song. I love the story behind it. So I wrote a blog post about how that motivation from that song took me. The day before that post went up. I had 35 people read the post the day before. The day that blog post went up, 7,700 people showed up to read it. Wow. That's a little bit of a jump. Yeah. And I went, maybe this is the niche I need to go in. So then we went down that niche and I, I was actually writing blog articles uh, and competing with bands for like SEO because I got so good at writing articles that I, I, I beat the Eagles on their 2013 tour. It was called History of the Eagles 2013 Tour. I beat them on that keyword seven times. Oh. Uh, like when you can beat a band at their own keyword because you're writing motivational things about their song. I was like, okay, now I learned SEO. What's next? I need to learn to monetize this now. So then I wrote my top five mentors. The number three person on the top five mentors was the man who helped me monetize and make this all something. The number three guy, I wrote an article and I sent an email to every one of these people I'm writing the article about and said, hey, I'm writing an article about you. Anything you want me to include or not include? And it, you know, Zig's family, they said, you can write whatever you want, Tim, we trust you. Tony Robbins, I got nothing from them. A guy named Billy Cox here in Dallas, he wrote me and said, you know what I mean? You know, he just encouraged me, like what I was doing, just said, good luck. I mean, yeah, write whatever you want. However, I've inspired you, obviously it's worth it. My first coach, Rhonda Hess, I wrote about her. But the middle guy, 
was this guy named Craig Duswald, who had a unique story about how he was a rock star and being a rock star in marketing. And his unique story was he worked for Air Supply and Guns N' Roses. Yep. And I, I wrote to him and I said, I'm going to write an article about you. He'd never heard about me. He just wrote an email back, called me this afternoon and wrote his phone number. I picked up the phone. I called him. And seven days later, I was sitting in his conference in Los Angeles, California. All right. And uh, two weeks later, I was in his coaching program. And like that changed the world. He now opened up everything we wanted to do. And that's where we learned how to monetize it. All right. How to actually get your marketing in line, how to have a product or service to go behind it. You know what I mean? That's a roundabout way of how we got there. It was not like a bam overnight, like we all think it is. No, it took time and it took a step at a time. Yeah. Now, how did you learn about Craig? Like, what was the the way you learned about him? Uh, actually, I was doing a Google search for, you know, rock star marketing, rock star. Uh, you know what I mean? Rock stars in business. And he came up as he was known as the rock star speaker. Right. You know I mean, And, you know, his brand was called rock star marketing at the time. And that was what highlighted it up. And again, he was a it's kind of like me. He was a little more relaxed in what he did. He wasn't mm-hmm. like the. He wasn't like the, the, the suit and tie people that right. I was trying to avoid. Yeah. And that that's what helped me uh, really connect to him on a personal level. And again, once I connected to him on a personal level, that's been the key to my thing. If I connect to somebody on a personal level, they got me every time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, and, and Craig's such a great guy. You know, he's been on he's been on the show here on the Real Deal, and uh, fantastic. I love his story, and and what's cool, like we, I would say, certainly the three of us are very similar kindred spirits, having you know a variety of music passions. Uh, you know, we we all have that in common, and uh, using Rockstar. I mean, look, you can just see my yeah. my logo. Yeah. It's it's right yeah. there. Um, so I love that. And then you also, so that's when you really got to also, I imagine, understand the value of immersing in an environment like a mastermind and mm-hmm. having a coach and someone to light the way, as it were, you know, kind of help you light the path so you can walk it, but also let you know, hey, there's a, you know, don't trip on that over there. There, Here's mm-hmm. some opportunities. What were... What was the impetus when that, when you first went there? Because now this is the first time you're probably investing in yourself and in that way, like you know, paying for a coach or a mastermind or that kind of thing. What was that like for you? That was that conversation in your head that you were like, you know what, I got to do this. Like this is this is the time. Yeah. At first, I didn't want to do it. At first, I was like, man, I'm not paying for that. Why? Why? Why, why should I pay for that? And then I thought about it for a little bit, and I go, you know what? Those people who invest in their businesses grow their businesses. I spent all this time learning the knowledge. Maybe I need to connect with someone who can take me to the next level. Mm-hmm. And at the time, uh, you know, I mean, as I tell the story, some of you guys are going to maybe relate. At the time, I looked at his his program, which was like thirty five hundred or four thousand dollars, and I went, man, I can't afford that. But I was driving a fifty five thousand dollar motorcycle, <laughs> but I can't afford four thousand dollars for coaching. And I thought about it while I was at his event in California. And I called my wife, all right? And we were just newly married at the time. And I said, uh, you know, I said, Gwen, I'm joining this coaching program. I, I think I can scrape together the money for the down payment and I'll just figure the payments out. But in afford- order to afford this and have my business pay for it, I have to get rid of the motorcycle. I can't afford a $700 a month motorcycle payment and pay for this to build my business. I says, so while I am here, clean my bike out, take it to the dealer and sell it back to him so I don't see it when I get back. Because it was my dream motorcycle. Wow. I mean, this is a dream I waited years to get. And I said, take it back to the dealer. And my new new wife at the time said, no. If you want to do this with your business, you go through it and we'll find a way to pay for that coaching and we'll find a way to keep the motorcycle. And the motorcycle was part of my first two years. as part of my my whole uh, persona the first two years was making that investment and understanding that I, you know what I mean? I, I needed it to invest in myself. And I do have a picture with that motorcycle with Craig sitting on that motorcycle. Wow. And cool. because of my connection to Craig, I have a picture of Duff McKagan from Guns N' Roses sitting on that motorcycle. <laughs> right on. Good thing well, I kept it, huh? Yeah. Do you still have the bike? No, uh, I sold that bike in 2014. All right. Uh, I bought it. It was a 2011 and literally it was like 55,000 when I bought it. By the time I traded it in, it was worth like maybe 20. 
Like uh, it was a, yeah, I, I you need to I, carry, hold on to it for another 20 years to, yeah, it, it, <laughs> I, I, I did not buy my motorcycles to buy them and sit them in a the garage and wipe them down. Right. No, my bike in two and a half years of owning it, my bike had almost a hundred thousand miles onto it. Wow. I have this centerpiece back right here. You can't see it cause it's glass is I have two years in a row, uh, of 2011 and 2010 of the highest uh, in my Harley chapter, the highest mileage person of the year, two years in a row. And our chapter was the, that those two years, our chapter was the highest mileage chapter in all of the Harley Davis owners around the world. And I was the number one person two years in a row for riding the most miles. Insane. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I rode everywhere. Um, and, and my motorcycle, I've got a million miles on two wheels That's and insane. I've only had wow. one bad accident uh, very fortunate, um, but God. I traded. Yeah, I traded that one in because it was just worn out, and I got another one, and and I didn't keep that one. I think we we trade we got rid of that one in 2018, and we don't have any motorcycles. And my wife and I always had motorcycles until 2018. We just said, okay, we're done with that for now, and we're gonna take okay. a break. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I haven't ridden. A bit. I have a motorcycle in my garage, and it's been sitting for a while. Once you know, like geez, seven years. Once we had our daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. I just needed a little bit. They needed some brake work and stuff, and it just, you know, so it's inspiring me to do something with it anyway. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So now you've you, you've gone to this event. You started getting excited. Uh, Craig and you connect on the rock, you know, the whole rock star vibe, and there's no competition. It's all support. How did you then start monetizing? Like, what was it that aha moment for you that you said, oh, okay, wow, I can either charge, like, were you get charging for your services or were you charging for ads because now you are having viral posts? Like, mm -hmm. what was your your approach originally to start monetizing? Well, <laughs> this is going to blow your mind as a blogger. I never make any money on advertising. That my pot, well, my podcast has advertising on it now, but I never made any money on advertising on my blog. Okay. I made okay. money by products and services and Craig and I built a, a model where I was speaking and I spoke at an event and then I sold a package at the back of the room. Then I would host my own event to sell into a mastermind of mine. And I've created, I think like a, a dozen or so over the years, informational products to where basically I'm selling something from the blog or speaking for you to go try out this program. And that was how we monetized it and built it into a system. I, I, I have to, you know, I have to do everything with the what's the end goal in mind. Mm -hmm. So, like, I can't randomly. Well, let's try this. Okay, let's try this because uh, I, I don't know if you know, um, you know, CJ Ortiz from Metal Motivation or not. But CJ Ortiz used to hit me up. Why don't you have swag, man? You need to have swag T-shirts, and that's how he made his business was doing swag. Mm -hmm. And like me, I'm like, nah, I don't, I, I don't want to. Now I'm actually going to create a T-shirt with the blog and video con logo onto it. But like, eh, I just wasn't into that stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, that's how some people are doing it. I wasn't in, I had to have a purpose. Everything I do serves the next purpose, serves the next purpose, serves the next purpose, serves the next. And I, 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 that's how I built it out. And uh, I'm always refining that process. And yeah, you know, I have, yeah. high, you know, I have a platinum coaching, I'm an elite coaching and I have an inner circle mastermind and everything I do gets people to either join the inner circle mastermind, the platinum coaching or the elite coaching. That's everything I'm trying to do gets you there. That's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do. I'm not I'm not playing any other games. And who's your ideal uh, referral? Who's like your ideal client? Who do you serve the best? Like if someone were listening to this right now, who would be the person that you go, man, if this is what you're looking for, this is what you do, I can help you accomplish those goals. So the mastermind is actually filled up with people. Uh, well, not full, but about 50% of the people. And I'm going to say this, and I'm pretty sure they're not in your program, but 50% of the people who come to my program come to me because they've gone to all the fancy gurus and spent all their money in our broke. Mm. And they come to join my mastermind because it's 3,500 a year, dirt cheap to join. And they come there because they're broke. And then I'm their last ditch to try to save their business. And most of them we turn around because of the fact that we realize that you were, the reason you tried to invest with the Tony Robbins type is because you want the, the fanciness, but you don't have the assets to make it work. Right. All right. So that's the people who are coming into there. They're all entrepreneurs trying to put the system together. All right. Everybody who comes to my programs, they're entrepreneurs who don't have the system together. In other words, they they think they want to sell this. They think they want to do this, but it's like, okay, how is it going to work together? 
and we create the whole process from beginning to end of how it works together. How doing a podcast like this feeds your business. How speaking an event feeds your business and purpose behind it. And, and we've had people come through the program who left real quick because they weren't willing to do what it took to make mm. it work. You know what I mean? The number one investment you have, as you said in your beginning, is the number one investment has your time. And we have to teach people, when you don't have money, the first thing you invest is your time to make things work. And right. most people are like, I don't want that. I just want to put it on the internet and make a million dollars. Great. I'm not your guy. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love it. So you started doing the blogging in 2010, 15. did you say? Well, 2010, I start, 2010, I started the blog, right? And by the time I actually started talking about blogging, live streaming, you know what I mean? And, and the whole right. package was 2015. All right. And that's that's, okay. that's the area we went to. Yeah. So what has been your experience as far as technology and, you know, SEO and how, you know, blogging obviously was easier for most people at first. And because uh, doing video like what we're doing right now was not always so easy and so high quality. How have you noticed? Because obviously your blog and video con, so you've obviously incorporated video into it. What have you noticed as far as that shift, and where do you see potentially maybe things going in regards to uh, marketing and sharing your content through blogging, vlogging, etc.? So it's interesting you ask because just last Monday, a week ago today, from recording, we're recording, I was sitting in my mentor Craig's house talking about what my next year's plans were. Literally, we were, you know, I mean, it was us elite members talking about what we're gonna do in the next year. And Craig made us write down what, if you could if you could be labeled next year with one word on the internet, what one word would you want to be labeled as? And I wrote, repurpose your content. I want people to know me as repurpose your content guy. And I was like, what do you mean? Because yes, I started with a blog, the second thing I did was an internet radio show or podcast, if you want to call it. It was called an internet radio show on Blog Talk Radio. The third thing that kicked me off and literally shot me up was getting live on video. When I went live on video, Blab.im, I don't know if you were on Blab, Doug, when it came no, out in 2015. Yeah. I, I literally got on the platform and within less than 30 days had a 2,000 people following. And I was asked to be on everybody's shows. And I'm like, again, this big thing, me? Why do you want me? I don't get it, right? <laughs> But that told me that's what my audience wanted to hear from me. Your audience wants it, you get it. So then again, I can't walk into anything and go, well, let me just throw this into the mix. I'm like, oh, how do I make this work? So we created this whole repurpose idea. Take something like this, we record it. We then put it onto a, you know, a live stream. We put it onto YouTube as a video. We take the audio, put it on as a podcast. We take them both, write an article about it, make a blog post about it. It's, you know, then you take clips and blips from it here and there and you make social media out of it. And it's like, again, I have to have purpose behind everything I do or I don't yeah. do it. <laughs> Love it. Now, do you, were you, when you started doing video, are you doing your own edits? Are you doing, like, do you have a team to do it? Or at what point did you, you know, have to ever learn it yourself? Or did you always have someone to do some of the so tech I have a, stuff? I, I do have a gentleman who does my, like some of my editing. But for the most part, I, I know you guys are going to love this. For the most part, 99% of my content that's put online is unedited. Right. You get to see the raw Tim. Mm -hmm. I do not, even when I put the recorded video up, I do not edit out the ums and ahs and the, the blips and stuff like that. No, I keep them in. I don't know why. I just always do. And sometimes I find ways to disguise around it. And uh, I, I just like being raw. I, I know yeah. I'm on a show that's real and raw, so I might as well be raw. Go. Indeed. Yeah. yeah, full disclosure, I, I do my own edits, but my edits for this will be when it comes to the, uh, the podcast, I'll do a quick little intro. Yeah, yeah. And that's an outro, and do. that's about it. And then yeah. it goes out the whole long form. I, I don't edit it down or... Because look, just because there may be something for me that I thought was really valuable and helpful, there may be other things that other people go, "Ooh, that was it. Why would I cut that out?" So I just allow you know divine design to come in and and share whatever needs to be heard, be heard to whomever needs to right. hear it, and um, that's greatest way to do it. Yeah, it's you know, and, my my mistakes. If my mistakes help save you time and make you more money, by all means, I want to leave my mistake up there for you to see. 
Right on. Yeah. So the good news is, I guess, you were in your transition and, and out speaking and so forth during, you know, now we'll put a time stamp on this a little bit. During COVID, I don't know about you, did you lose gigs? Were there speaking opportunities that went bye-bye and the good thing you were able to still be doing video and blogging and so forth, but did you notice a a shift? Did you have to pivot in any way or were you just sort of just putting a little more energy into what you were already doing? Yeah. I Well, I, I was on virtual events like from the moment we got locked down the first time, I was on, it was 28 weeks in a row, I was on at least virtual events speaking. I'm sorry that you, you paused a little bit. How many? Oh, now I'm losing you again. During the pandemic. And the key was, is the pandemic hit. Uh, I've been doing my mastermind thing on Zoom for years. My, my coach actually hit me on how to run Zoom. My coach didn't know how to run Zoom. I had to teach him how to run Zoom and how to make his stuff work. And he ran his first first virtual event. I was in the background helping him. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So this is obviously a time where you were able to navigate uh, rather well and add value the other way. Yeah. Um, yeah. How many did you find that you were able to help a lot of other coaches, speakers, authors, et cetera, because they were locked down and now they go, hey, I need to learn more about this this blogging thing because my audience that I used to have, I don't have the same access to. Yeah, it was. There was a lot of people came to me for advice. There was even restaurants here in the Dallas area that came to me for advice. And hey, how do we make it through the lockdown time? All right, we know that you're an online marketer. What can what can you do to give us advice on how to make us through this? And I was giving advice to people to not only just you know blog, but how to use these tools to interact with their customers. And then, you know, one restaurant actually was what we'll come up with. We come up with a, they come up with a campaign to um, deliver, you know, well, it wasn't delivery. You had to drive to, like a drive through type service when they didn't have a drive through. <laughs> and it was, they were doing specialty beers and stuff like that. And you basically stop by and every week I would go through the drive through line over there in my truck and, and pick up a six pack of their custom brews. Or like it was three custom brews and three cheap beer, beers. <laughs> Package kept them afloat. All right, and they still ended up closing that location down, but it kept them afloat, and that's what we did. Is we, we I jumped in and helped anybody. I jumped in immediately with my own clients, and and made a deal with them. All right, I said times are going to be tough. Some of you aren't set up to, to to weather this, so let me come up with a way to help you weather this. And we only lost two mastermind members during the pandemic. Everybody wow. stayed, and then we gained six new six new ones. So love it. Yeah. And for your strategies and so forth, are you doing a lot of the, uh, like email and texting or is it purely social and you know viral kind of stuff? I'm big on email and um, and I'm not big on texting, but like I text with my clients, but I'm not text marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I could, my friend Victor Vento, I don't know if you know Victor, he's big on text and he's always hounding me to get into it. And I'm like, nah, I don't want to go to that. But uh, like I like emails, so I'm big on build the relationship on social, and then email is my follow up. Uh, which like you've been on my my podcast, you mm -hmm. notice everything I do to communicate is by email. Right. Like right. you know what I mean. I, I I'm big on uh, walking you through one step of every process with an email. You know, yeah. and that's that's the communication tool. That's not the marketing tool to get you in because some stranger sends me an email and says, "Hey, I can help you with this." To you, send me dollars i uh, uh uh send it by a bitcoin because like i don't have an address and i can help you and i'm like no uh, no i build relationships with people using social get them to come to my sites and uh, then build a relationship via video or or some or article that makes them go let me take this first step got it and what has been your uh most successful or have you changed at all right because it originally you know we could date ourselves knowing remembering myspace right facebook obviously is huge then instagram and uh, uh TikTok and snapchat and all of these are you on all of them or do you focus on one specifically <clears throat> have you noticed some shifts in um efficacy through the different platforms so I still am huge on Facebook and YouTube. Those are my two main. Mm -hmm. I try things out when they come out. So in other words, I tried Snapchat, tried Clubhouse, all right. I tried 
uh, all the things. Like I have, a, I have a, a very good presence on Instagram and Twitter. I have a large presence on Twitter. LinkedIn, I'm. I got to tell you, LinkedIn's a great place, but I'm just not. It's not a great tool that works for me. I haven't found a way to work into my realm. Mm-hmm. Um, am I against any of them? I'm not against any of them. I have a client who's huge on Clubhouse and TikTok, huge on them, growing through leaps and bounds, and I don't get it. You know what I mean? There's also other tools out there that, uh, you know, I have one client who's going big on Facebook groups. I have very little I do with my Facebook groups, but I have them. I'm not a rock star in them. But Facebook uh, live video and get people to come off the live video and come to my stuff is is that's what works for me best. But hey, if Snapchat and Instagram works for you, by all means, study it and do it. You know, right on. So, what is your your workflow like to get in a little bit of a hot dog conversation here? Meaning, like, how do you make it? Um, you like, what is your philosophy and your engagement sort of? philosophy and idea like you put something out on on facebook and then are you continuing to add value are you looking for a strategy call like what is your your i guess you know your your workflow um i do like live live stream videos to my facebook on my business page on uh-huh. you know i mean almost every day and it's all it. something informal to try to help you get to understand me, maybe a little bit of life lesson in there, something like that. So if someone is on stuff. right now, they could find you on uh, your Facebook page. Is, is it Tim Gillette or is it uh, Blog and Video Con? Do you have a different name for it, your business page? So my business page is facebook.com slash Tim Gillette Rocks. So um, my Facebook, my, yeah, my Facebook profile, because I used to look like Tom Petty is Tim, our Facebook.com slash not Tom Petty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I still kept that one anyway. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, the, and I have two groups. I have a group that's called blogger, vloggers, podcasters. That's the general, anybody can join. And then I have a blog and video con group. And what that group is, is we do our, events every month and we broadcast the event in the Facebook group and then we get the interaction in there uh, oh, nice. for the event and that's the events the virtual events that people pay for to do to, to be at so yeah right on so yeah let's talk about a little bit the events that you you have coming up and and what can people expect and who who would it be for what what would someone expect so most people who are coming go hey, going hey is uh, online marketing for me do I should I have a blog should I have a podcast should I have we have a, an event called Simple Easy Events. It's a simple, easy marketing, virtual events, simpleeasyevents.com. And that is designed for those people who want to learn online marketing at their own pace. What those events do is we broadcast them live every month. Uh, our next one is going to be, I think, September 18th from this, from the date we're recording this. But like every month, we have a chosen day. We bring in five speakers to train, something that helps you with your online marketing. And if you can attend it live, let's say we're using that September 18th, you can attend it live, great, you attend it live. If you can attend the first two sessions, you attend the first two sessions, but you get the recordings to it to watch at any time you want. The idea behind that group was anybody can join it who wants to dabble in and figure out. We have a very low cost uh, to get into it and it's a lifetime membership, a one-time fee that's a lifetime membership and we give 50% of the money away to the charity of that month because it's all about helping those people going, well, I want to learn. And, and we have experts who, to, who pay the, the fee and join just because they're like, I want to be part of this community. Mm-hmm. But it's designed, hey, I want to learn, but I don't know. And, and, and to figure it out. The next level we have is if you want to come to a live event, we do two big live events a year. The next one we have coming up is Blog and Video Con. It's our biggest one we do over the year. This year's not going to be as big because we're just not going to deck the halls. Not sure who's going to be willing to show up in this pan, uh, you know, in this current situation we're in. Mm-hmm. So we're doing a smaller event that's more like we do in May, and it's a one-day mastermind, one-day training event. But normally that event is built around the fact that you come there, you're meeting with a bunch of people who do the same thing as you do. You have a community, or, or you're starting to build a community, but you want to learn how to build it. We have speakers who share about it. I share our signature programs. And then we have breakout sessions where basically you may learn more from the five people at your table than you learn from me teaching on stage. Or you guys may sit at the table and talk about how to implement what was just taught from stage and come up with an idea all together. 
And actually, from our blog and video con, we've had people go home and create new companies. They met at the at the event and they go home and they create a whole new podcast together, which turns into a company, which turns into product services, and they go a whole nother realm. And uh, you know what I mean? It, it's it's bizarre the way things happen. It's designed to be an event, but but an incubator to right, connect right. with people who who want to grow. And then in the in the spring, we do a thing that's. Uh, we, we, we're changing the name, so I don't know what it's going to be called at this point. But in the spring, it's designed to be a mastermind slash event. Like it's kind of like what we're doing here in, in in this blog and video con, but it's going to be unique. And that is the fact that it's going to be a mastermind type event. It is designed to be a smaller amount of people come into a room, and then we talk about what's going on in their business for day one, and then day two we come back and train on exactly what we said we wanted to learn. So it's like you're you and I are sitting there talking on day one at the mastermind session, and you know I really like to learn something about here. This is what I want to learn this weekend, and you tell me I want to learn how to repurpose my content using LinkedIn. Well, the next day somebody comes in and goes, well, here's what I know about LinkedIn, how I can help you do it. Right. So it it, it basically day one we all put out on the table. This is what we're trying to learn. Day two. Not only do we have two speakers coming in to share it, but we have a group of people who are at the tables going, well, have you thought about doing this? You know what I mean? So, yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So what advice would you have for someone who is kind of at that point of, okay, do I do a podcast or they're doing it? They're doing a podcast or doing a blog. They're doing a video. They're doing like, do you have something that or a philosophy around like some people say don't do a podcast until you're more established other people like do a podcast to get yourself established other like there's you know there, there's all these different ideas and philosophies uh do you have one in regards to that do you have a, a like an ideal timeline or anything of that nature based on all of the opportunities that are available i, I i'm a firm believer in go try find out what do start by trying what you like all right. Most people will not try what they like. They will tell, well, you know, I met I met this guy, Tim, and he said I should do. I'm not a fan of go do because I said so. Hmm. No, I'm a fan of go try and figure out what's going to work and what won't. Give it a test. In other words, you want to try blogging? Give it a test. Create 100 blog posts and see what people follow or like. You want to do a podcast? Start with scheduling one one day a week. And just do it for, you know what I mean? Try it for a three month period of time and see what happens. See what your numbers do. You want to do live stream video. That's a little bit more intense. And we tell people do that at least twice a week, if not more. Mm -hmm. Do that for a year and then look at your numbers because live streaming is going to be different. We have a client who found journaling to be her, her way of communicating. That's huge that she's out teaching journaling and she used her blog to journal. We have a gentleman in our thing that's great at a podcast, skyrocketed, started this whole thing with a podcast and it just skyrocketed where he went. Another gentleman, big making YouTube videos. You know I mean, then I have uh, one of our, our biggest students that we have in our program right now. She's a Disney Imagineer, made a lot of famous things that you and I know about that she's the puppeteer and stuff behind them. Mm. She turned on her camera and started broadcasting on Facebook on Mondays and Fridays. She built an entire community of people who want to show up, talk to her about art. Wow. And she creates stuff like the little, like this little thing here. She creates stuff and then sells them to her community. Uh, and like this is number, oh, I don't even know my number, what unit I have. Oh, number 17 of 50. Wow, cool. Uh, but she built a, she built a whole community uh, and she's got people in her community paying her $1,000 a month to be in her community. Brilliant. She's a, she's a Disney Imagineer and like has created a lot of famous things. A little mm -hmm. bit different than, hey, I'm just Joe Schmo. Who, let me talk to you about car washes. Pay me a thousand dollars a month. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and on that note, how have you found and have you had to shift as far as getting people's attention? Right, the subject line, the the title of the show, the you know all of that stuff. It's it's such an interesting um, dynamic when, from my experience anyway, watching what like you know you, you hear the term clickbait. Uh, yeah, yeah. What has been your experience around that? What have you found that maybe has worked and not worked? Or do you even worry yourself about that because you are coming from a philosophy of, you know, the contents, what's important? 
Well, I, I am. I've always followed this philosophy. I don't know if you know James Malinchek or not. You know James? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, he's been on the show too. Yeah. James Malinchek said something one time that made a world of sense to me, and he said, you know, if someone asked him one time, "How do you get seven hundred? What's the one you'd use to get seven hundred people?" At? And he said, "I can't tell you one way to get seven hundred people at my events, but I can tell you seven hundred ways to get one person in the room. Don't go with one way. Mm -hmm. Stop with that idea. Well, I got this way to work. I'm good. No." keep recreating yourself I, I i throw weird things out every now and then just to make people come back and go what's he going to do next right you know what i mean the howard stern thing why do you listen because i want to know what he's going to do next <laughs> you know that's what you got to do and you got to keep number one you got to it keeps you on the edge right if you are never if you ever stop doing the creating you you die all right mm -hmm. and again from another you know, famous people, and I listened to them, whether you like him or not, years before Donald Trump was president, Donald Trump spoke in a room and he talked about a friend that retired and then tried to make a comeback 10 years later and did nothing but fail. And Donald Trump said, I will never retire. All right, now I'm not, whether you like him or not, and it's not the thing. That stuck with me about Donald Trump. He said, I will never retire because if I retire, I will never be able to make a comeback because it's harder mm -hmm. to restart. When you stop and go, well, I'm good. That's why we have so many one hit wonders in music. No, I. Ooh, be recreating new ideas. And I, I don't know, I may, be, I may come up with giving away a free box of air or something soon. A free box of air? Yeah, I've done that before. Uh, like, you know, Texas air. I, I'll sell you a box of Texas air for 20 bucks. Love yeah. it. How many buyers did you have? Uh, I think about do a dozen people bought it. <laughs> Awesome. With every session, you get a free box of air. We'll send you a jar of air if you're uh, really lucky. Well, wow. it's 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 unique to do it, all right? Mm -hmm. And it was a great campaign that we did. Uh, I learned from Mark K. I don't know if you know Mark. Mark is a, a talk show host, but he also does mm -hmm. internet marketing. And I seen him do something that made me think of it. And the idea behind it was the box of air was getting it, it's a it's a sales funnel and it's just getting you I, i'm gonna do this to get to the next like just to see what's on the other side mm -hmm. so they would pay me the 20 bucks for the box of air just to see if i really was selling it right and on the other side i said well obviously you trust me like you know you gave me 20 bucks you realize there's nothing in this box and i would get you know, the video is me shaking the box up there's nothing in it but you gave me 20 bucks anyway i'm i, I told you that up front <laughs> so you trust me and then i give them like a month in my you know, program my my hundred dollar a month program for for for, for the twenty dollars as a gift. You know what right. I mean? And I said, if nice. you want me to send you the box of air, click this button. I will send you the box of air. But if you don't, you just want this free. Click over here and get this for a month for free. And okay, yeah, nice, <laughs> love it. Um, and so, if you were to share with someone like. I got the not retire and the, the, the keep moving, keep taking action. What has been maybe a defining philosophy for you and any advice that maybe you would have given your younger self that if there is someone who could benefit from some of the education, the uh, foibles, the distinctions that you made on your journey? I would say make as many mistakes as you can when you're younger. Uh, I wished I would have made more mistakes when I was younger and, and not been so cautious as to do things. Because mm -hmm. some of the things that I tried, all right, they go, well, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this to prove it's wrong. They actually worked. You know what I mean? Uh, for instance, <laughs> not business-wise, personal-wise, uh -huh. my roommate that I worked with at Starbucks, she met her husband, now they're divorced, but met her husband on eHarmony. And when he was moving into the house and she said, by the way, He's moving in and we're taking over your bedroom. Your... Uh, she said, you should go to eHarmony and try it. Maybe you'll meet somebody. And I said, that doesn't work. Let me prove you wrong. My wife and I have, have been together for 12 years now. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Trying to prove my roommate wrong and we're you still together. You showed them. All I right. showed them, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So how can people get in touch with you? I want to honor your time. And of course, uh, if there's anything else you want to share, please, by all means. Um, but I really appreciate you being here. How can people get in touch with you to learn more and, um, you know, dive into what uh, you're about even more than what you've shared today? 
Sure. I mean, you can go to my site. My name is Tim Gillette. Yes. Yes. Gillette is my last name. I am not a sharp guy, but my last name is Gillette. <laughs> uh, T-I-M-G-I-L-L-E-T-T-E. It's not spelled with a J. TimGillette.com. All right. You can join my newsletter. That's as simple easy. But if you want to get something, let me give you this, guys. All right. All right. You look at me. Look at my uh, short hair. How would you like to learn a lesson I learned while I looked like Tom Petty? Go to nottompetty.com. I have a free training there. It's about 10 minutes. You don't even have to opt in. You can just go watch the training. Tell me if you like it. It's a, it's a good advice for you to learn out-of-the-box ideas. Okay, nottompetty.com. Yeah. All right. Well, and in the comment section, there will be the info to get to uh, simpleeasyevents.com and blogandvideocon.com. And how many years have you been doing those two? Blog and Videocon, we started in 2018. The Simple Easy Events, we got our trademark in 2020, and we started doing them in early 2020, just before the pandemic. Wow. All right. Oh, and we hold and we hold the trademark on Simple Easy Marketing. That was our, our trademarked name. So beautiful. Well, brother, I can't thank you enough for sharing your most valuable asset, your time, your wisdom, and beyond. Um, I will be looking forward to checking some of those out. You may see me at these events as well. Anything I could do to contribute and add value and be part of the the community? We're gonna get you. We're gonna get you to a blog and video con day. I'm telling you, you're, yeah, you're, we're gonna it. get you there one way or another. One of these days, I'm roping your butt to Texas. <laughs> well, and of course, one of the things I'm sure you know uh, that I do are breakthroughs. So if you you want to have them walking on glass or doing a arrow break or fire eating, you know, you break the arrow with your neck. I'm sure you've done all of these. Uh, we could even do a fire walk if, uh, you know, yeah, you, cause you know, that's so the inclined. one thing I've not done. Right. I know. Yeah. That's why I was, uh, putting <laughs> we it out talked there. about that on my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'd never done that. Yeah. So just, you know, food for thought. Maybe that would be the time to uh, just, say that's you know it's maybe it's time thing. maybe yeah. it's time yeah uh, anything anything we could do to add value to just the world and and help people get their story out there get their message out there and and really that's how we're going to transform the world is by everyone just sharing their their best self their mo most authentic self uh so thank you so much for that you bet honor to be here man i appreciate all you do man Right on. Well, I appreciate you for who you are and who you aren't, and uh, looking forward to more rock. See ya. Bye. Thank you so much for stopping by and hanging with us, and remember to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast right here, and we look forward to serving you even more. Remember, download your free guided hypnotic meditation at guidedhypnotic.com. That's guidedhypnotic.com where you'll get your free anxiety-busting meditation. We look forward to serving you, and if you have any questions, comments, please feel free to reach out. All right, we love you for who you are and who you aren't. God bless.